<laughs> what is your uh, favorite like oddball species of fish to chase through the ice? Oh like, boy. Not walleye, not panfish. That's a very that's a difficult easy, question. Easy question. <laughs> I want to say my favorite weird fish. Favorite oddball species? I know it's really popular now. I don't know if it's an oddball. I don't know if it's weird or not or odd, but I've always enjoyed catching them. I like big white fish. True big lake white fish. Largemouth bass. Oh, I love fishing large. You can target them. Absolutely. Through the ice. It's white bass. White bass? Yeah, for sure. White bass are fun. I will say that. I feel like this is kind of common, but lake trout, it's not a... That's not an odd species. He wants an oddball species. Um, Listen when he asks you those questions. Burbit. It's burbit. I'm going to go with burbit. Burbit. I love eel pout. I absolutely love fishing for eel pout. Eel pout, yeah, I was going to say that. I, too. you know, I've had, and now yeah. it's cool to chase burbit, but I've yeah. always enjoyed catching them. Especially you know, the northern Minnesota ones look yeah. like a cheetah. You know, you get bass thumb, I had burbit thumb. I, you wrap around your arm, it's just a cool deal. You're like, yeah. <laughs> was it a Rylander that was in the tub with the... Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is lake trout normal or is that... Is the burbot hot tub guy Because I'm following. not going to say burbot and he's going to say lake trout? I also, I do have a thing for rock bass. Really? So, <laughs> I am a two-time white bass world champion on Devil's Lake. No, you're not. Right? That's a thing? Yep. I'm madly falling in love with lake trout. Well, you know, I like fishing for anything. I don't know if there's anything I don't. What I like to do is I like to fish for something on purpose. I'm the same way. I mean, Cisco is like, yeah, white fish. Some of them are kind of embarrassing. I like catching creek chubs, I'm not going to lie. I mean, I've never met a fish I didn't like. Right, right. I mean, thing. I just love fishing for it and figuring it out and catching it on purpose. That's what kind of trips my yeah. trigger. Welcome back to Angling Buzz Ice. This episode's all about unique ice bites. Large and in charge. From bass <laughs> to burbot. Whoa, so you came up before. Lake trout. Look at the crew. Yes. And tulipy. They're electric, they bite. It's a system. We're going to check out some fun and overlooked ice fishing opportunities. If you can find green weeds, you can find largemouth bass, and the best way to find these are with an underwater camera. Ooh, all right. Look at that nice stuff. Little mix of coontail and elodea. You know, fishing green weeds under the ice isn't a super common thing throughout the ice belt, but there are lakes that have green weeds. Um, up where we are here in central Minnesota, we have a lot of mid-depth, mid fairly clear lakes, lakes with eight to 12 foot of clarity, and the weeds grow deeper and they stay green most of the winter. And believe it or not, a lot of the fish use these green weeds almost the whole winter till ice out. Anglers are so used to fishing, you know, basin crappies or rock pile walleyes or um, you know, big deep flats for perch, but green weeds, if there's good green weeds, fish use them. And the reason they use them is there's a lot of life there. But you put the camera down and throughout the whole water column, you see critters, you see movement, little things flickering around. And if you look closer, it's mostly zooplankton, whether it's Daphnia or copepods or other kinds of zooplankton. And that's what those fish are in there feeding on, the little fish and the big fish. So the green weeds, bring oxygen to the area, the warmest waters around them, and the uh, food is there. So if you can find green weeds, you're probably gonna get some good fishing in it. And a good way to find green weeds is using a camera like this little Aquaview Micro 5 Revolution. And you know, the best thing to do is just cut a bunch of holes, look around, and look for the weeds. And with this having color, having a color screen on it, you can see if they're green, like the weeds we're fishing on right now, we've got cabbage up higher that are in like six, eight feet. Then you get out into 12, 14 feet and you run into coontail and elodea, which is a smaller weed, but they're only growing a foot, foot and a half off the bottom. 
But if you sit there with a camera and watch long enough, you'll be seeing fish swimming over the weeds. And a lot of times the big bluegills in the middle of the day are in the weeds and they're swimming through the weeds and around the weeds. So whether it's bass, pike, walleye, or panfish, finding green weeds and fishing them with a camera is often a really good option for ice fishing. Oh, on bass. Nice large mode. So cool catching these things. They're pretty finicky often through the ice. One of the things that we've seen with largemouth in particular is minnows are just a great way to, to catch them, particularly shiners. But I've caught a lot of fish on this bait right here. This is a slab wrap. So often when people are fishing in weed beds, it's fishing with little micro jigs, that kind of deal. But having a big presentation with you, and this isn't that big, this is a size four slab wrap, can often be the ticket to catching really nice bass, really big crappies, and even big gills. We'll bite it if you just put like a single Euro larva on there. So get this guy back and I'm gonna catch some more fish. Seen anything, Mikey bud? What's that? See anything? No, I'm just, I'm trying to find another good hole to put a flag down where I'm not gonna get hung up in the weeds. It's been pretty quiet though. Large, got one. It's nice when you have the doubles come through. You get them, Jer? I do, yep. It's amazing right now, the fish just seem to really want to have a bigger bait. I can't get them to go on the small jig and plastics. Wait, oh, I'm on the bottom of the ice. There he goes. Big, oh, huge walleye, huge walleye. Where do you see this thing? Huh? How do you like that? What a fish, man. Unbelievable. It pays to fish big, I'm telling you what, it really does matter having a good sized bait, you know. This is a, a classic spot where there's crappies, there's sunnies, there's bass. And all the time when you're fishing this stuff, you're usually fishing with tiny baits, but I could not get a lot of the fish to respond to a small bait. I switched it up to that slab wrap, I've been pounding bass and now this big walleye. It's unbelievable. I'll share with you the rod that I'm using for this system and it works really good. Don't be afraid to go big. Sweet, get this guy back. So the stick that I've chosen to fish with this slab wrap is, this is a St. Croix custom ice rod. This is a 32 inch medium light power extra fast action. So it's got a lot of really good flex in it and I like the fact that it bends a fair distance down the blank. That helps hold on to the fish once they're hooked. And that extra fast tip works really well for not only setting the hook and detecting bites but also working working the lure. So one of the things you're gonna to wanna to make sure you've got with a, with a stick like this is you want a tip that's balanced. So this number four slab wrap, if you just watch this tip, it's got a little bounce, bounce in the tip, but it's not overpowered. A lot of times you'll see guys that are fishing baits and when they're jigging it, the rod is already partially loaded. That makes it really hard to have good control on the bait. So you want it stiff enough that you can move the bait effectively, but also a little flex in it so you can see if the fish come up, you can see the up bite, or when they bass in particular, a lot of times the bite is just real subtle. You'll just see the tip move ever so slightly and you can pound on them. Now I've got this spooled up with braided line. This is four pound suffix 832, the ice, the ice braid on it. I really like this super light braid for this combo. I use the same rod a lot of times for fishing spoons or a little bit, uh, heavier crappie baits, basin fishing. So I like that braid for the deeper water. And I also like the braid for these, for, for fishing in these shallow weeds like this. It helps me cut through cover, et cetera. And then I've just tied what's called an Albright or you could tie an Alberto knot to the end. And on there, I've got five pound test fluorocarbon. So that combo works really well for fishing a slab wrap in weeds like I am now. It also is a great combo for fishing uh, baits like Base and crappies, a little bit heavier baits, and it's also a good walleye stick. So a 32 inch medium light extra fast is a really good versatile rod for fishing a number of different kind of medium sized ice fishing baits. There he is. Oh, you get him, Jer? Oh yeah. This is pretty interesting that I set up next to the tip up here. I really do think there is some truth to the deal that uh, when you have multiple lines or you've got something in the water can really keep the fish's attention. Like having a number of tip ups around, I feel like just keeps fish in the area and it keeps them interested. 
I've been seeing bass in all the holes that we've been fishing here and some sunfish and crappies, but I set up right next to the tip up here and it has been one after the other after the other. They're not biting like crazy, but I'm seeing fish all the time. You know, underwater cameras are an awesome tool for ice fishing. Um, this particular unit, the Aquaview Micro Revolution 5 Pro, is one I use a lot, and I use it for finding fish, for finding green weeds, for looking at structure. But another thing that's really fun for me, and I think makes me a better fisherman, is using it to understand fish behavior. And it's amazing to see what fish do and don't do depending on the day, depending on the light situations, and depending on the weather. So um, I happened to be out here on the same lake a couple days ago and had a flag down and it ran all day and I only got two bites. But the whole time it was down, there was fish coming and going, looking at the minnows, biting it but not taking it. By watching what the fish do and how they react to your lure or your bait on a line like this, you can kind of get a better idea of how you might need to fine tune your presentations, like lighten your leader up, put a smaller hook on, maybe put a jig on. Fish behavior is really interesting when you watch it on a camera and I think by just doing it over and over again, watching fish and how they react to your baits will make you a better angler. And as curious as these fish are, if all else fails and you can't get them to bite anything else, use the camera as bait. Speaking of underwater cameras, check out this cool catch. GoPro. <laughs> Two morons trying to film ice fishing and put the camera up on the ceiling and guess what? The GoPro and you've never dropped anything. Never, on ice hole, have never. You? No, no. So we're we're trying to salvage our GoPro here. One of the many uses of a jig and wrap. Yep. <laughs> There's a jig and wrap. I just got to get it going the right the right way. Okay, it's going over. Should I do a slow lift or just try, I don't and, know, try, to, try and snag it? Nothing to grab on this thing. I wonder if I like put a, one of those um, predator rigs on. Hmm. All right, GoPro on the bottom still, pulling out the big guns. Number nine wrap with a predator rig hooked to the bottom. Multiple trebles. It's got to happen. My favorite GoPro is on the bottom, dang it. So what's the strategy with your rig here, Mike? Well, to hop it on the back side of the suction cup and give it a, a little shot and drive the hooks into the rubber. There's, oh, it's, oh, it's on something. The, the Rapala is... Oh, it's definitely hooked on something. I'm gonna do it by hand here. Do you want me to go oh, up Oh, I got it, I got it. Yeah, grab, the, grab the rod behind me, Nick. The rod behind get, get on oh, this that's... side of me. Yep, I got Top. it. Okay, I got it. Very, very slowly, foot by foot. If I get this up, it'll be better than catching a 10 pound walleye. <laughs> I'm actually gonna get down in the, in the fighting position. I'd have to explain to your dad why I lost a $500 camera <laughs> just by being a moron. Yeah, let's mount this camera directly above. Uh, the hole without putting a cover on it, on wood. I gotta make sure that it doesn't hit the side of the Cool. This is like a plan operation. It's gonna be tight. Oh. Were you good at operation? Oh no, oh no, oh no, Mike? oh no, oh no. Oh. You want me down there to land? Okay, you got it. 
Oh, yes! That's going on the wall. Guess what? 53 minutes, 41 seconds of run time. So we got some really good stuff. <laughs> big mud cake down there. Well, that was a true test of this, uh, the supposed waterproofedness of a GoPro and the um, refuel frame. And just a little tip here. This was a good call <laughs> by you, Mike. Number, number nine jig and wrap. With the mini, with the mini predator, right? Gang hooks. The more hooks, the better. Okay, can we get back to filming now? <laughs> we haven't even finished filming. Okay. Yet. <laughs> we have a bunch of great ice opportunities down here in the states, but once you get north of the border, things get pretty special. Let's check out what Manitoba has to offer, and hopefully, we can get up there soon. Oh, there's taller than me. Look at that. <laughs> That auger is taller than I am. <laughs> That's how we do it on Lake Winnipeg. It demolished oh it, boys. That is goodness. insane. Just dropped it down. No way. Fat rattle bait. Oh. Look at that. Ooh, giant. I, I just drilled that hole too, gentlemen. Look at how thick that thing is. Let's go. Here we go, 28 inch green back. Back to the deck. Let's do it. Let's go. He's going. And there she goes. Kicks her way down. Yeah. yeah. Lake Winnipeg may be the most well-known, but it's not the only big lake in Manitoba with walleyes. Today we are out on a huge lake in Manitoba, and it's not Lake Winnipeg. That is the average, isn't that crazy? Not talked about as much Lake Manitoba. And right now, according to our guide, Chris Torney, and the fish are super duper chunky. This is an average fish here, and uh, it's about twice as thick as it should be. Also another interesting thing about this lake is he says that he never catches walleyes deeper than 10 feet of water. Definitely a little different than uh, back home to be fishing in six feet and if you do too big of a rip you can feel your bait hit the bottom of the ice. <laughs> no way on the rattle beat. No way. Yes. Check out this chunker. Holy cow. Oh, oh Brett's got one. Brett's got one. Yeah, they're just starting. Brett! Baby, baby! Oh, killing it. Yo, Broadback. That spoon is so pretty too. What's that one? It's called the Peg Spoon by Clam. The Named Peg, after. as in like Winnipeg. <laughs> Big, fluttery, buttery, good looking thing. And I guess it works over next door too. <laughs> Razorback. Obviously Manitoba has plenty of walleyes, but we can't forget about the burbot and lake trout too. That is the coolest colored trout I've ever seen. Show this baby out to the camera quick. No word of a lie, man. That, that is gorgeous. Giant. Wow. That's a beauty. Unbelievable. There we go. Oh. This is the right one, buddy. Got him? Oh my goodness. Please. Look at the colors on yes. the fish. <laughs> Unbelievable. I don't think we're in Minnesota anymore, boys. <laughs> no. Somebody give me a high five. Yeah! <laughs> That's a Laker sign right there. Lakers are definitely an apex predator with a lot of power. This lake gets me my heart pumping every time because we've seen some absolute tanks come out of here of every species. Oh, I got bubbles. You know, heist fishing is one of my biggest passions. And so that's what's so awesome about where I am now up here is because we have such a long ice fishing season. This is why we come to Northwest Manitoba. Big burbs, big lakers. Where else can you do that? Woo! So we actually start ice fishing beginning in November and we'll go right through April. So you know, we got a solid six months of hard water action and, and there's no other place I'd rather be than out here with a rod in my hands. Yeah! <laughs> oh, we get excited over that there. Nice. All right. Well, much to my chagrin, we are leaving biting fish. See you later. We are leaving the trout and pop bite. And the only reason why you would ever do that is because you have something possibly special ahead. And we're going to see if we can catch some big, giant Canadian gators. Sweet fish. This doesn't suck. We were just so over here. Flag. Oh, flag. We got a double. Things are going wild. We got a double. Just over here chatting. Will jig one up. Oh. And here we go. Woo! Get up here, big boy. Here. That's a beauty. Don't mind if I do. 
These guys caught a 45 incher. 40 what? Like 41 and a half and a 40. <laughs> in the first half hour or yeah. something here. And uh, so we figured we better get our butts over here and get in on the action. Nothing there, man. There's nothing there. What's going on, man? I can't figure it out. They just take my bait and they just steal it. So what's what's the setup here? What we're doing is we just made a great big ring around our home base. We got tip up set down, running you know seven to eight inch carrying in mackerel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There we go. That's Dude. what we're coming here for. Why are the fish here? Fish are here because it's a shallow bay coming in and feeding. Nothing to do with spawn right now. Not a bad jack. How many fish have we got so far? Oh, that's a good question. What do we got going on, Durham? It's catching my breath, that's all. <laughs> Legs, I'm gonna say 25. You know, you want a good workout. Come up here and start running for flags, it's insane. Probably landed 17. Oh yeah! Fish. The biggest is 45. You want to catch a big pike? Come on up, this is absolute insanity. When you catch as many big pike on tip-ups, as they do over here. Time out of the water means lots of fish. Time in in the water means more giant northern pike in northern Manitoba. Big old <laughs> northern Manitoba gators right there. <laughs> awesome job, Thank buddy. Thank you very much. Look at that. Speaking of Manitoba, let's talk about moose. And moose is definitely a unique bite on the ice. Ty picked up a nice Coleman grill. We're gonna grill up some of that moose steak that he shot up in Canada this year. <laughs> One important thing that I need to teach Ty is the importance of putting these things together at home. So you're not out here on the ice with tools that might work to get the job done. It would've been a heck of a lot easier just to have it done at home. You know, some people just cry about everything. Oh, you gotta put stuff together. Oh, bring tools. So if you're going up on a trip, put your stuff together at home. You gotta put that on too. I don't know where it goes. So high maintenance. So we're having moose steaks. Uh, Jason got the grill all set up as this little side dish to moose. We're gonna add potatoes. We'll cut them up. We'll add some butter, wrap them in foil, and throw them on the grill. It takes probably 10 minutes, and then uh, we'll throw the, the steaks on with it, and we'll be ready to go. And then just a little bit of just add some seasoning, some salt and pepper. It's pretty simple. And wrap them up. And we're ready for the grill. So got the steaks all thawed out and ready to go on the grill. I just, you know, moose meat, I don't put a lot on there of anything. A little bit of salt and pepper um, is all I like on it. Just because just the meat on a, on a moose, in my opinion, is just the natural flavor. It's so good. So I got both of those seasoned up. As soon as the potatoes are getting close, we'll throw the steaks on there. It doesn't take very, very long. Get you some audio. Listen to that sizzle. That's how you know they're cooking right. Moose, like a venison uh, or beef, typically I don't like to overcook it. That won't take long. The more you cook it, typically it gets a little more tough, but a, a moose steak, rare to, to medium, in my opinion, is probably the best tasting meat that you could have. I hope the flag doesn't go off while we're cooking them because I'll probably burn them. <laughs> the steaks will just, somebody will watch the whole time. The cameraman will watch it. <laughs> no. Mm -mm. Look at him. He doesn't even have all his teeth. I'm not trusting him cooking that food. <laughs> you can see this side is done. A little bit of pink on the other side and give this about three, four more minutes and we're ready to eat. Uh, well, that right there is on the ice eating at its finest. Moose steaks and potatoes on the grill. Does it get any better than that? I don't think so. Cisco's are a major food source for big fish, but they're not just fish food, they're also a blast to catch. I think one of the most overlooked species throughout the ice belt are ciscos, or otherwise known as tulabies. You know, they're really fun, they fight aggressively, 
and they're all over in a lot of basins and a lot of lakes. You know, a lot of these areas where I'm searching for walleyes and perch, tula bees exist, and these things can be really, really fun, and they come in in big numbers. When it comes to Cisco's, you know, some of my go-to baits are really small spoons, anything in that perch pattern. They also like gold and silver, things that are real bright and flashy. And then just tipping that either with Euro larva, uh, wax worms, or a minnow head. You know, usually when I'm walleye fishing like this, I've almost always got a minnow head on, but if you downsize that minnow head so they can fit that in your mouth, you're just gonna hook up, your hookup percentage on them is gonna be much, much better. Now, tulipies have pretty good eyesight, so I like to fish high in the water column and let them come up to the bait. And it, it's funny how they feed too, because uh, with walleyes, you know, a lot of times you slow down your presentation to that light jig. With tulipies, it's more of this bounce, this flutter, where they'll hit it on the fall and you almost always catch them as, it, as that bait tumbles down. You know, it's, it's unmistaking these Cisco's because they chase not only high in the water, water column, but they also yo-yo up and down and up and down. They're chasing that bait, you know. Man, I tell you what, they fight like crazy. They never stop, they're always moving. And you know when you're hooked up on the Cisco's because when you set the hook, it's just that, you know, it's unmistakable. They're always moving that tail. You know, the one thing about Cisco is as well, they're, they're a lesser white fish and they're absolutely fantastic when they're smoked. And, you know, it's just a species that often gets overlooked by people out here. They're not only fun to catch, but I tell you what, once you throw them on the smoker, you'll be keeping more Cisco's, that's for sure. And you know, they're, they're nomadic roamers, so, you know, it's important to get your bait on and get it back down there, almost like perch fishing, where you, know, you want to get your bait back down there and keep their attention because you know that they're just roaming out in this vast basin. Here we go. <laughs> what a fun fish. I mean, you want to talk about endless amounts of fish that no one's really targeting, and they're just all over the place, they're electric, they fight. It's a Cisco. It's just a fun species to fish on the ice, period. While we're on the topic of cold water fish, the Great Lakes offer some unique bites. Let's join Jared Houston on Lake Superior. The sun's coming up, beautiful day. We are taking on Lake Superior, Shawamigan Bay, and Ashland. Got a good group of guys out there. The goal is to bend rods, but also more importantly, have fun. Stick with us, we're gonna have a good time, right boys? Let's get it. What's really awesome about targeting fish on Lake Superior is, again, the diversity, the dynamic bite you have out here, and the different species you can get. One of the put and take fish that's very popular for people to come out here and catch is a spike trout, right? It's a near coastal water trout that has those genetics of a brook trout, but has that ability to fight like a lake trout. It's a mix of a lake trout and a brook trout. And that's what makes a spike trout really awesome. Also, the brown trout. I mean, it's absolutely blowing up out of proportions these days. It's doing really well. It's on its way to being as equal as a Lake Michigan uh, trout fishery. We've caught a lot of fish from 25 to 30 inches and you know, five years ago, we weren't really catching all those. I and mean, we were catching once in a while, but most of them were pretty small juvenile fish. So they're growing and they're doing really well. If you come out here and you spend a full day, eight o'clock in the morning till well after dark, you have the opportunity to do a great job with a mixed bag. And when I mean mixed bag, I'm talking more than what you're gonna catch on any inland lake. It's clear, it's crisp, it's fun. Get out there, enjoy it. You're gonna have yourself a great time. So one of the biggest things that uh, you don't want to do when you got the buddy system going and you're out drilling holes is not box the next guy in. So we like to do parallel lines. It keeps everybody at an even take of having the best chance of catching fish and not ruin the other. You see community holes pack up all the time in big circles or boxes. Well, the guy in the middle, he always has a struggle, but the guys on the outside tend to do better. So if you put yourself in a line with your buddies, you're doing yourself a big favor. You also kind of want to be out when we're fishing on this Lake Superior here. Sometimes the current might be so bad that you want to have yourself a transducer hole because you want your bait to be picked up on the side of you. So we don't know what it's doing today, but it comes in and satiates. What Lake Superior has that people don't understand is a tide. The tide is called the sache. And what that does is when we have strong northeast winds or out of the north and the, the south shore here, it blows a lot of water in here. 
after those winds retreat, that water goes back out. So your bait might be going like this for half the day, and it might be going like this for half the day. So it's important to sometimes put holes right next to each other so you have a transducer hole and your jigging hole. In the 10 years I've been fishing out in the Twin Ports area in the extended areas of Lake Superior ice, uh, including where we're at in the confines of uh, Chihuahuan Bay today, um, the fishery's been awesome. It's dynamic, it's diverse, it's a lot of fun. These fish that live in this water are very wild. So they're always 100 miles an hour and very spontaneous eaters. So there's really no rhyme or reason on what you do some days. And, uh, and that's just the way it goes. Nice, beautiful splake trout, Lake Superior, hatchery fish, the put and take kind. Woo! They don't quit swimming even when they get to the shore. <laughs> They're unbelievable, powerful fish. You know, it's not the, the most biggest fish you're gonna find in the sea, but pound for pound, it's hard to compete with them. It's real nice. These setups here, he's got real, real thin diameter monofilm and almost crystal clear line in this crystal clear water. It is a giant adv advantage for these fish because they can't see um, it. Uh, the one thing though, when you're playing with it is that you gotta really finesse it. You don't wanna really horse it or she'll be, she'll be cooked, man. You'll snap off. Ready, Chris? That is a lake trout. Hold him up there, bro. Chris, thank you. <laughs> so when we attack this water on big water, as in Lake Superior, the most important thing to do is spread out. I know it's real nice to sit next to your buddy and stuff, but um, you know there's a lot to be said about hole hopping on inland lakes and other types of bodies of water, but that's just not the case out here. It's really kind of a patience game. Um, a lot of people take it as a like kind of like bow hunting for a big deer. Right now we got uh, five shacks out here and we're all split up about a half a football field apart. The other thing is, you know, in Wisconsin waters, the Shawamigan Bay, you can use three lines per person. So you set up yourself in a strategic jigging spot and put tip-ups and set lines on each side of you. So we just did a, a track 400 meter dash to get here. Yeah. And uh, we're heavy breathed, but that's okay. We're gonna be even more heavy breathed when we get to see this guy or girl. Woo! Giddy up, Chris. Nice fish, buddy. So in Lake Superior, sometimes you get a lot of current. It's very important to think about the mindset of what lure you're using and what spoon you're losing. Today we're using Northland Fishing Tackle Spoons, of course, and uh, this is the Glow Shot. Glow Shot is an excellent spoon, but when we got a lot of current, this is a little counterproductive. What we have out here is sage, so when the sage happens, that current takes this thing off to the sides. So although it's very good and, and, and all that stuff, it works really better when the current stops down and it's got more bling bling. So when you're jigging on a like calm or the current's taking a break, it does a lot of wobbly stuff. So that's the way I like to go in that tactic, but I'm not really fishing deep water with that stuff. The bigger, the heavier, less profile wingspan of a lure is more important to me. So I got two of them here. You got a Northland Buckshot Glider and regular Northland Buckshot Spoon. So the difference between these two, obviously, is the wingspan. This one here will move and do a lot more bling bling, zing zang, stuff like that, where this one's kind of more up and down and vertical. This one is able to take on current a little bit better than this one, but if I'm in shallow water, I would prefer to do this one. Deeper water, I prefer to do this one. And even further than that, I like the bling of a Northland Fishing Tackle Macho Minnow, which has that little fin that does a little zing zang at the bottom of that. Point being is bring them all with you because you never know what kind of conditions you're gonna have in Lake Superior. They change by the minute, by the way. And so it's important to have all bases covered. And what I mean is bring all the lure selections you got with you. Oh, goodness gracious. Breaking the species barrier. Salmon, baby. We First salmon we've caught all weekend, tell you what. Yeah, beautiful silver, baby. Um, it came out of nowhere. This thing shot up like a rocket. I couldn't be more happy with the what a great weekend with these guys, man. What a fun couple days on the ice out of Lake Superior. Yeah, I mean, couldn't ask for better weather. It's late season. We're getting down to the end now, baby. Yes! <laughs> All right.
All right, to kick off this episode's cool products, we're gonna start with a bait that could catch every species of fish we've talked about so far. And that's the clam pinhead minnow and the clam jointed pinhead minnow. Now, they come in a variety of sizes and colors. They give off a ton of action and a bunch of flash and they're gonna flat out help you catch more fish. And just right here, we have all the clam plastics, including this poly. And now you can tip this on a jig, you can tip it on a spoon. It's a great alternative for live bait. It's gonna give your lure a bunch more life in the water. Now here we got a great tungsten jig option made by Northland, and that's their Mighty Mouse Jig. It's made of tungsten, so it's gonna get down there quick. It comes in a variety of sizes and colors. It's just a panfish killer, but it also works great for tulipy, whitefish, and trout and you can tip this with your favorite plastic or live bait. All right, so back over here. We got something new this year from VMC, and that's their tungsten mustache jig. Now what's unique about this, is it's got a dual appendage plastic, so it's gonna give a real lifelike action in the water, and it's just a great multi-species tungsten jig. Now if you're looking for a reliable ice braid this winter, Suffix 832 is a great option. It comes in three different colors. They have sizes from four pound all the way up to 30 pound. It has gore performance fibers, so it's gonna help limit ice buildup, and it's abrasion resistant. We've talked about jigs, but here's a great hard bait option, and that's Rapala's Slab Wrap. Now this bait comes in three different sizes. It comes in a multitude of colors, including a bunch of UV options. Its minnow profile kicks off a bunch of vibration and flash, and it's just a great big fish bait. How do you like that? What a fish, man. Unbelievable. It pays to fish big. All right, we've talked about jigs and we've talked about hard baits, but how could we forget spoons? So now I get to talk about my personal favorite, the Northland flutter buckshot spoon. Now these spoons come in three different sizes, 1 16th ounce up to 1 4th ounce. They have a multitude of colors as you can see. They're great tips with live bait and have a sound and action that really calls in the fish. All right, now it's time to talk about rods and reels. And to kick it off, we're gonna start with Northland's Haymaker. Now this rod comes in two sizes, 24 or 28 inches. It's a solid carbon blank with an ultra fast tip. It also has a reel seat. And this rod's a little lighter, so it'd be great for your, like, your stream trout, tulipy, or whitefish. Now here we got another rod option, and that's St. Croix's Legend Black Ice Series. Now these rods come in a variety of sizes, all the way down from 17 inches up to 48 inches. They come in powers from ultra light to medium heavy. It's a solid carbon blank with a built-in reel seat, and what's really unique about this is it has a built-in spring bobber for detecting those super light bites. All right, so we've talked about rods, now it's time to talk about reels, and here I've got the Daiwa QG750. Now it's right between their 500 size and 1000 size reel. You know, it's not too big, it's not too small, it's just right. It's also got a super smooth drag system, and at this price point, you're not gonna find anything better on the market. It's also got five ball bearings and a collapsible handle for easy storage. All right, here we got Strike Master's 40 volt lithium auger. And I've been using this thing for two years now, and this thing is awesome. It's hard to beat. I mean, you can get 100 holes on a single charge and 16 inches of ice. The battery charges in two and a half hours and you get your standard eight inch bit, or you can get a 10 inch bit for those unruly fish like lake trout, burbot, and big pike. All right, so now that we can cut holes, it's time to find the fish. So here I've got Hummingbird's Ice Helix 5 Gen 2. Now this unit offers you your chirp sonar, it offers interference rejection, and this is gonna be the most economical option for an LCD sonar out on the market today. On the topic of electronics, let's go into underwater cameras. Here I've got Aquaviews HD 7i. Now this has a seven inch high definition screen with a 1080p HD camera, which gives you a crystal clear image. It's got 75 feet of cable. It's HDMI compatible, so it works great in wheelhouses. It's great for finding fish and finding structure, and it's a ton of fun for the family. Now, for all you wheelhouse anglers, this is a must have and this is Catch Cover's Slush Bucket. What you do is you set it on top of the hole. 
when you're drilling your hole, all the slush goes into the bucket, you dump it out and it keeps your house dry and clean. Now, for those of you heading out on ice you can't quite drive on yet, this product is a game changer in saving your back, and that's Clam's Sled Pulling Harness. Now this is a two-point pulling harness. It makes pulling your sled a breeze, and it also works for hunting. Now, there's no need for a sled pulling harness without a sled or a house. So here I've got the Clam Fish Trap Nanook XL. Now Clam's been making houses for over 40 years, and it's actually the 40th anniversary of the original fish trap made by Dave Gens. All right, so this house features a 600 denier shell to help cut the wind. It's got multiple doors. It fishes two anglers very comfortably. It's got a ton of room, as you can see, for extra lines. And also, like the original fish trap, it folds over and collapses for easy transportation. One product we forgot to talk to you about is the Tuned Up Custom Rods Commander. Now this rod comes in sizes from 32 inches up to 38 inches. It's a solid carbon blank with recoil guides. It's got a sensitive tip that loads into some good backbone. It's great for burbot, walleye, or any big fish you can throw at it. Burbot are generally caught after dark, but certain times of the year you can get on a great bite during the day. Now there's like three of them down. There's a whole pack down there. Come on, he's chasing it up. Ah, here it comes, he's chasing it. Come on, oh. My gosh. <laughs> what? It's something coming up, but I can't tell if it's a burb or a tulipy. Things are happening though. He's on me. Oh, I can feel it like bumping into my line. He's down. Hopefully they're coming this way. So cool watching him find it and yeah. then back pedal yep. to like line up before they eat it. But you can see what, like the moment that they bump into it and feel it, it's like they change how they're swimming. If you were gonna harvest burbot, this would be the pout I would recommend harvesting. And in our home state of Minnesota, let me get this one back, Brett. Um, burbot have just become a game fish species. Where we live in the central part of Minnesota, this is their southern range. They're very common in Canada, but they get big, they fight hard, more and more people are enjoying the sport, so. Man, respect the pout. Respect and like you said, game fish now. Game the fish. The cool thing is, the walleye season's closed here. Pike yep. is closed, bass is closed. If you want to go out and catch something that actually fights back, what options do you have, you know? It's you chase right. some bluegills and some crappies, and that's one of the reasons that we first started doing the burbot thing, is you can bust out your same walleye gear, Catch something that stops when you set the hook and you still oh, get those head shakes and man, they fight. So fun. Oh, it doesn't get any better. It's a magical time of year. It is a magical time of year and it's a social thing too. We've got, you know, Brett and I and Nick and a few buddies like once, you know, kind of late January, February rolls around. It's a, you know, a couple nights a week. We, hey, let's get the boys together and we just go out hunting for pellet. And they, I mean, they start, you could catch them any time of year. Winter is definitely the, the best. I mean, we start catching them generally mid to late January is when it starts to get consistent. Yep. February is good, and then March is the kind of the peak of the peak of the spawn. It's so. better and better until you basically can't get out on the ice anymore. Oh my God! Look at them. Oh my God! No freaking way! No way! That is unbelievable. That's it. That's what they do. That's what they do. Wow. Oh my goodness. This is amazing. Bill is filming right now with the AquaView and they're actually spawn spawning. It's an actual spawning ball and I can see it on my sonar right here. This is They're not interested in biting, but there are so many fish here. There's got to be what, 15 fish down there, Bill? It's hard to judge because they're, they're milking. It's hard to judge because they're milking up the bottom so much. That's and also crazy. They're, what they're doing is like this. Oh, that is so cool. Oh my goodness, that is so crazy. Oh man, the cool thing about this is you can absolutely use your standard walleye gear for burbot and uh, catch all the burbot you want, but you do have a shot at catching a 10, 12, even, even bigger burbot than that. So if you really want to step up your burbot game, I would get yourself a big old whooping stick, something that's a, a 36 to 42 inch medium heavy or heavy 
and uh, then you're in control. So like, let's get this thing back. But man, if that thing wasn't spawned out, it would be just a freak. The thing with these fish is they move. I mean, they're just always on the move, especially this time of year. But regardless of what I'm doing, and if it's, you know, nighttime fishing, in January and February, we cut a lot. I mean, we just cut, we cut, we cut. It's nice to have a group of guys. You know, I basically, I'll fish a hole as long as I feel like at night when my jig charge needs it. So about every five minutes, I'll fish five minutes. If I don't see your hookup, I'm moving, just constantly moving. And you'll see depths that they may often prefer. So sometimes you'll see they're running a, you know, that 30 foot seems to be a good depth. Other times it's 22 or 18. I mean, I've caught them. Nighttime, midwinter, as shallow as you know, 12 to 14 feet on, on weed edges. But really, the sweet spot in terms of depth for me, it seems like it's that 22 to 32 with like 25 to 28 being the, being the money. And right here, and then 25, and there's been bird that comes through just steady. Dude, daytime birds? Yeah, buddy. <laughs> You'll notice where basically everybody's fishing in line and that's just because the break is so sharp through here. So if we go 10 feet that way, we're in 40 feet, you know, 10 feet that way, we're in 15 feet and that, you know, 20 to 30 feet seems to be the magic depth. And the areas we've found to hold the most pout are near big flats. Often they're big weed flats. It might be from, you know, four to 12 feet deep where they drop really sharp. It's those really sharp wall drops seem like those are key areas for holding pout. This is a classic burbot area here where you've got the deep water. It seems like they relate to the deeper basins, you know, that are 30 to 100 feet deep or whatever. But then it's the, the big flat. You can see this is a huge flat area through here. And I've gotten my depth highlight set up between 20 and 30 feet. So you'll notice in that green, there's not a lot of green. It goes from 20 to 30 feet really quick. And so areas where we almost see none of the green are some of the key areas. So it's a really sharp wall drop. Anywhere in these little turns, these points, this is all prime, prime burbot water. On, there we go. It's not a big one. Not a biggie. Oh. Right by the hole. Oh, he's twisting, come on. There he is, nice. Just another nice one. Look at that. And that one came on hot skirts again. Dynamite bait. Now one thing I've got going with uh, my setup here is the line I think makes a big difference. Let me get this one back. See what it is here quick and I'll tell you about the line. Another male. Nice. I'll say goodbye to this dude. So traditionally a lot of ice fishermen tend to fish with smaller size reels. With this burbot deal, I like a size 2500. I'm fishing with St. Croix Custom. This is the trophy taker, the CCI, but a 2500 size reel. This is a Dio Fuego, just a sick drag. But the big thing I've got on here is mono. I like fishing, I fish outside in the cold a lot. I personally like mono, mono for that. And this is Suffix Advanced Mono, and it's six pound test. And this six pound I've found to be just insane. It's like you can't break it. I know guys that are fishing deep diving crankbaits in wood with this stuff. I've caught big flatheads on this stuff. I've caught giant, giant fish. And that six pound mono sheds the ice really well. It handles heavy lures really well. And then the other thing I do is I run a swivel because you will get line twist with that. The smallest VMC swivel I can. And I make it just about a, oh, you know, maybe a, six, eight inches longer than what the ice depth is so I can see it. And then I run a 14 pound fluorocarbon leader. That's it, that's the program. I'm gonna get back down to another. Please be recording, Uncle Bill. Oh my God, that is unbelievable. That's it, that's what they do. Wow, oh my goodness. That is so crazy. Now before we close the show, we wanted to start a new segment where we take a couple questions in the comments and answer them. To kick it off, we'll start with a question from Moxon underscore 63, and they asked for the 10th time, will you guys do an inline reel episode? We're working on it. All right, this question comes from Hawken Ewing. Do you always put a minnow head on your spoon or other walleye lure? My answer to that would be yes, most of the time. Spoons work great with minnow heads on them. 
Um, they give them more action. And walleyes are notoriously finicky biters at times, so that piece of meat on the end often pushes them over the edge to bite. But there are some baits where you really don't need to put a piece of minnow head on there, like a wrap, jigging wrap, um, a tika minnow, a puppet minnow, or like a leech flutter spoon, which has a feather on the treble. So when uh, fish are aggressive enough, those baits often work good without one. But I would say for the most part, it's hard to beat a minnow head on a walleye bait. Now my next question is from P. Moore 1307 and they're wondering if there's any way to tell what size a jig is if you don't keep the package. And I've got a couple things for you. The first is you can just stay organized. So what I do is I label my boxes. So if it's like 164 ounce, I'll label that. I'll put them in there. If they're like three mils, four mils, I'll just label right above where I put them. So that way I know. Another way is you can get a gram scale and weigh them. And you can find a gram scale for like 20 bucks online. Um, that's another option, but I think the best is just staying organized and keeping it labeled. All right, this question comes from Northern Redneck. How often do you lose fish on two pound test line? I would say not that often. Um, two pound test is really super light line, but if you're rigged right with a nice reel with very smooth drag and a softer rod for fighting the fish, um, it might take longer to get the fish in, but if you fight the fish right, you really shouldn't lose that many fish on that light of line. All right, so this viewer question comes from Steve Bogan and he's asking, what's your opinion on fishing near cracks in the ice? So of course, be careful around cracks, take safety concerns out of it, and let's talk about fishing near cracks. So there are a few situations where I've seen fishing near cracks to be productive. Number one is areas where it's basically a featureless lake. So take Lake Winnipeg or Red Lake, when you've got cracks in the ice, sometimes you can actually have essentially structure or cover from the surface rather than from the bottom. So that can be an area that can attract bait fish, it can attract fish, for whatever reason, fish seem to like those areas. I've caught fish on both of those systems, Red and Winnipeg, fishing near cracks in the ice. And the other place where I've seen it effective is when you've got black or clear ice. And when you get a crack in the ice, a lot of times water comes up so you can get any kind of snow and often you can have opaque colored ice near the cracks and that provide some type of a basically a light transition or shadows in the ice. So I've seen fish bite near cracks in basins for crappies when you've had I've seen opaque ice and also on shallow or flat. So it's providing that additional element of cover which is just basically shadow. So fishing near cracks can be a thing but of course remember to be safe near them. That wraps up this episode. Make sure to check out our website where you can sign up for our newsletter. We'll also be releasing new content each week on our social platforms. Thanks again for watching. Good luck out on the ice and stay safe. It's a good rumor to start. It's, it's true. Uh, killing a bluegill is bad luck. And it gives you worms. It, it creates more bills and more taxes. Yes. And it gives you worms.